Hi, Tom Altair here, Certified Functional Medicine Practitioner, and I had a client a couple weeks ago that inspired me to do this blog post. So I'm concerned. There's a lot of people walking around and they're taking supplementation and they're not quite sure the biochemistry behind it. They don't know how these things work. So it's my job. I have two degrees in nutritional sciences uh, to educate people. So I would like to do that now. So let's talk about those of you who are taking vitamin D and calcium supplementation, usually calcium in the 1,000 to 1,500 milligram range and vitamin D in the 2,000 to 5,000 plus range, you know, you might be at ri increased risk for heart attack and stroke and might not even know it. So let's get down and dirty. First, we'll talk about this person who inspired me, 70 year old person, just a delightful human being. I'm so honored to know her. And she comes in and she says, look, for the last 21 years, I've been having these random problems with tendon calcification. Of course, there's joint pain, osteoarthritis, and other things. So let's look at this. She gets diagnosed with IBS at the age of 32, which tells me she's not going to be digesting and absorbing nutrients very well. Then over time, she gets aortic stenosis and recurrent calcification of the tendons. So stenosis basically is we have uh, closing off of due to plaque formation in the arteries and then in the aorta specifically here. And then we also have calcification, so deposits of calcium in her soft tissue. She can actually palpate the calcium in her tissue. She gets diagnosed with osteoarthritis, which is oftentimes indicated as calcium deposition in the joints. And she gets decreased bone density at 53. So this is telling us the calcium is not making it in to her bones. However, she is taking 1,000 milligrams of calcium and 4,000 IUs of vitamin D now, right? So that should be great. She should be protecting herself from bone issues. Well, I ran a test called the vitamin K assay that kind of proved that that may not be the case. In fact, her supplementation could be putting her at further risk for stroke and heart attack. So let's examine how this works. Well, number one, this is not new, right? We see in 2011 here, British Medical Journal, they were tracking large amounts of women and seeing when they took higher levels of calcium, higher levels of vitamin D, they actually ended up with 24% increase of myocardial infarction and combined stroke and myocardial infarction, which is a heart attack, it was a 15% increase. Another 11 year trial here, looking at those who were taking supplemental calcium or supplemental calcium and other supplements. And if it was other supplements and calcium, it was 1.86 hazard ratio, meaning it was 1.86 times the amount of heart attack. And then if you're just looking at calcium supplementation alone, so not out of the supplements to balance out the calcium, it was a 2.3 times hazard risk. So that's quite significant. Now, Here's another trial saying among calcium tablet users, they were looking at 500 milligram ca capsule or tablets here. If you also had 1400 milligrams of calcium through eating a lot of dairy and whatnot, your ratio for all cause mortality was 2.57, meaning you were 2.57 times more likely to die. So that's, that's not good, right? But this has been around. The conventional medical uh, literature was showing us for quite some time. This is Johns Hopkins University, their blog, right? The, Hopkins University blog says past studies have shown that calcium supplements can accumulate in the body's soft tissue rather than making it to the skeleton. Look at this over to the left here, this little thing that says here, patients should really discuss any plan to take calcium supplements with their doctor to sort out a proper dosage or whether that they even need them. So we're told so often we need these high calcium amounts to keep things in our bone, but we're not talking to about how it gets in the bone. So let's go there, okay? So we have this increase of calcium. Calcium can cause trouble if it doesn't go where it needs to go. Idle hands do the devil's work and teenagers with a lot of extra time usually get into trouble. So maybe calcium does the same thing, right? The New England Journal of Medicine shows us, man, vitamin D is amazing. This is an intestinal cell. Look at this, this is an intestinal cell. And when there's adequate vitamin D around, this intestinal cell will read its genes differently. It'll start reading something for a protein called calbindin or a calcium binding protein that literally reaches out, grabs the calcium and pulls it into the intestinal cell. Now, if you have adequate vitamin D, you get 30 to 40% of your intestinal calcium coming through. If you have inadequate vitamin D, you only get 10 to 15%. So that's you know, three to four times higher the amount of calcium in the system. Now, interestingly enough, if you're pregnant and lactating, that increases up to 80%. So that's a phenomenal increase, an influx of calcium coming into the system. So hopefully you'll know what to do with that calcium, right? Wouldn't you want to put that calcium in the bones? Yeah, why not? 
Well, you can do that. And there's a, a beautiful protein made by the body when you increase your D level, right? It's called osteocalcin. And osteocalcin literally means osteo, like osteo, say the bone, cal, calcium, and in. Put the calcium in the bone, right? Okay, so that's a wonderful thing to have around. But look at this, osteocalcin needs to be in a specific form, right? Because in the human body, form equals function. So if it's not in the right form, it cannot bind the calcium, it cannot deposit the calcium into the matrix of the bone, uh, the bone itself. So you have to have the form. What causes the form? Well, a cofactor in an enzyme called vitamin K2. You don't have vitamin K, you don't have osteocalcin in a form that can bind calcium and put it in the bone. In fact, if you look at the chemical structure of it, it's, it's fascinating, right? The active site is this carboxyl group with another carboxyl group that kind of grabs onto, claws onto the calcium and then allows it to transport and go into the bone. So this carboxylation of an actual glutamate is what it's called, only occurs with vitamin K. Vitamin K1 does this for blood clotting factors. Vitamin K2 does this for the osteocalcin and for another protein we're gonna talk about called matrix clot protein. But in essence, if you want calcium transportation to occur, if you want to minimize the threat from excess calcium in the body, you need to have adequate vitamin K around so you can carboxylate, you can add an extra arm to these particular proteins and have them do their jobs, okay? So if you don't have them doing their jobs, what's the risk? You have an increase of calcium, where could that cause problems? Well, of course, in the joints, it could be arthritis, right? In the brain, it could be Alzheimer's. In the blood vessels, it could be calcification. And interestingly enough, all the cardiovascular disease research is jumping in right now and saying, hey man, coronary artery calcification is the thing. It's the marker. It surpasses the blood cholesterol and the blood pressure, all the Framingham study research. It's, it's the thing. So let's look at this calcification. And when we do look at this, we see, look at this. In these less than 45 year old people, if they had an elevated, greater than 400, coronary artery calcification score, they were 34.6 times. That's 3,460% increase likely to die than those who had a CAC score of zero. So across all age groups, we're seeing this in the literature now that we really have to look at this calcification balance. At the center of this, K, vitamin K, and specifically vitamin K2. Vitamin K2 works in the periphery. It's gonna work in the bones, gonna work in the vessels, the brain, the joints, whereas K1 primarily works in the liver with the clotting factors, right? So we're talking about K2 here. And when we have adequate K2, we get that carboxylated osteocalcin, but we also get something called carboxylated matrix glaw protein. And matrix glaw protein is eloquent about going around and salvaging calcium from the vessels. Now, if you were to block off carboxylation reactions of K, we would see more calcification, right? And we do. All you have to do is take warfarin, coumadin, any of the anticoagulant medications in that class, and they're actually literally called vitamin K antagonists. So they will actually block vitamin K activity of carboxylation. When people take warfarin, 16 to 35 months, they have a two-fold increase in size of their calcification. Now here's the key, the opposite occurs too though, right? Because we see in animal studies, when vitamin K2 is given to those who have induced cal uh, calcification on warfarin, you can reduce that, you can regress that by pulling some of that calcium out of those vessels. In fact, it's protective across humans as well. 360 women, coronary artery calcification is watched and the levels of K2 that go up in the diet, calcification goes down by 20%. Same with the Rotterdam study, a very large study. The mortality risk was reduced by 27% and 50%, 57% based on the amount of vitamin K2 that was ingested in the diet. The, the moderate amount, 27%, higher amount, 57%. And basically we're looking at about 25 micrograms or about 40 micrograms So for those two different areas. We'll talk about that in a second. But here's a study that actually says, look, you can approximate a 9% decrease in coronary heart disease every 10 micrograms of vitamin K2 intake. Okay, so where are you gonna get this? So it looks like in this Rotterdam study, it was meats and eggs were MK4. And we'll talk about what that means in just a second. Fish, sauerkraut, cheese, and other dairy products, specifically pasture dairy products, would have other MKs and a very protective one called MK7. Now, when you had these servings of dairy, of eggs, of whatnot, you found a 25 to 29% reduction at 21 microgram base, 33 hot top. 
So you're looking at about 25 micrograms versus above 33 micrograms. Well, what does that mean? That means if you like natto, you're set. <laughs> if you like fermented soybean pâtés, fantastic, good for you. There you go. You get per 100 grams, you get 1103.4 micrograms of MK7. That's fantastic. MK7, there's two different types that we're going to be talking about. MK4, it's a shorter molecule, shorter half-life. It doesn't last very long in the body. MK7, it's a longer molecule. It actually lasts much longer in the human body. It carries out activities at much, much smaller amounts than MK4. So if you're eating a lot of goose liver or natto, you're fine. Otherwise, you're going to have to be eating a bit of hard cheeses or soft cheeses or pastured egg yolks. Some of the cottage cheeses and butter and whatnot have smaller amounts, but you'd have to eat quite a bit. It wouldn't be as effective as taking a supplement or eating some of those other uh, food sources like the liver or the natto. All right, so scientists are saying, look, there's enough data. Let's start supplementation in people. Let's see if we can reverse cardiovascular disease risk. And this is what they're doing. This is a trial that's about to go here. It's called the Vita-K CAC trial. They're looking at coronary artery calcification and vitamin K2 supplementation in the form of MK7. And when they're supplementing this, this is the hypothesis. Look, we hypothesis, hypothesize <laughs> that treatment with MK7 will slow down or arrest the progression of CAC and that this trial may lead to a treatment option for vascular calcification and subsequent cardiovascular disease. That's exciting. Now this trial ends in October of this year, so you're gonna to have to wait multiple months after that for publication, but it's promising to show that maybe we could be reversing and or treating cardiovascular disease. So how much in what form? There are three forms of K. All of them seem to be protective, some more than others. It turns out the MK4 and MK7 trump and uh, the K1 supplementation. So let's focus on those increasing for sure. But K1 can be beneficial as well. So let's see that the MK4, right? We talked about this being shorter, shorter half-life. It's really only one to two hours. You need to be taking it throughout the day. MK7 has a longer half-life and you can take it in lower amounts. So it's going to be less expensive. So what's the actual dosing? Well, if you look at the cancer trials, you look at the bone trials on MK4, 45 milligrams per day, but it has to be taken in three divided doses. So 15 milligrams three times a day. That's one way. Another way, MK7 can be done at 90, 160, 380, or higher micrograms per day. And the trials show benefit with decreasing some of these undercarboxylated osteocalcins, matrix GLA proteins, so decreasing calcification risk. However, bone density hasn't been shown to move on the MK7 yet. So because of that, I'm usually recommending a combination of MK4, MK7, and MK1. I use something called uh, 3K Complete that I'm going to show you here in just a second. Now, the hypothesis, this, this blew my mind, right? Maybe it's not the, the, the vitamin D. Maybe it's not the calcium. Right? I mean, if you get too high on calcium, it doesn't seem to be helpful. But too high in vitamin D, I, I ran across this paper when I was lecturing on vitamin D across North America. I was in Canada, I was all over New York and Arizona and Texas. And what I, what I saw was toxicity was not common. But when it was common, it ended up because calcium levels would increase. And it turns out, according to this hypothesis, that that's because of a K insufficiency. When you have adequate K around, Calcium in circulation won't increase. You'll end up putting the calcium in the bone, you'll utilize it, you'll excrete it, but without adequate vitamin K, it's possible to have vitamin D toxicity. All right, so you want a balance of all these things. You want a minimal amount of calcium, about 700, 500, 800 milligrams per day, not much higher, especially if you have adequate D or K, but you wanna really focus on K, you really wanna focus on D. So if you want to see a little bit more about my recommendations, you can go to this video here, bit.ly forward slash K24 CBD and learn more. But let's get back to why we're here. We're, we're here because you may have an increased risk. So how do you determine if you're at an increased risk? Well, if you have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, if you have inflammatory bowel, irritable bowel syndrome, if you have digestive issues, celiac disease, Whipple cystic fibrosis, you're probably not able to get in as much K as you would like. If you have any sort of fat malabsorptive disorder, or you're missing your gallbladder, once again, vitamin K is fat soluble, so you might not be absorbing that as well as you would like. It could be 
that you have a stroke, a heart attack history. It could be that you have calcification of your carotid artery, of your aorta. You may have some sort of evidence so far that these imbalances are already occurring in you. And thankfully, there is a lab test that we ran on this particular person, vitamin K assay from Genova, that can actually look at whether or not there is an increased need for K2. So this coronary artery calcification has been associated with this specific marker. It's called undercarboxylated osteocalcin. It's basically an osteocalcin protein that's missing that extra carboxyl arm, so it can't carry the calcium around. We see in multiple literature articles that these are directly associated with the calcification problems. Here's what the test looks like. It's called the vitamin K assay. This is a sample uh, test from Genova. So you can actually run these. They run about $200. Go to your physician. We have an MD here in the office and they can run the serum draw and the serum analysis will tell you if you have an inability to add a carboxyl group and the only thing that helps you add carboxyl groups to this particular protein is vitamin K. All right, great. So you know what foods, you know what supplements, and now you know a laboratory analysis. I sure hope you can help yourself find optimal health and avoid your risk of heart attack and stroke. Hope this has been helpful. I hope uh, we see you again soon.